Dear selfish friends, Western culture frequently identifies the self or also the soul with an inviolate, independent, self-sufficient, responsible and, let me say, identity ego. Conversely, Jung prolongates the ego development, which is basically the goal of the first half of our life, towards the self, a concept borrowed from India, from Hinduism, in, from the word Atman. Paradoxically, Jung differentiates ego and self, and individuation in the Jungian sense is not at all ego-finding, but much more ego-losing. In the Christian tradition, the Logion for whoever wishes to save his life, his psyche, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, indicates this unconscious aspect of self-deepening, the decentering of our conscious ego. This talk will discuss philosophical consequences of the ego self-differentiation. So I'm glad to share with you some Jungian aspects. Basically Jung and his friend and scholar Erich Neumann. Some write the Jungian self with a great S, different from the pity ego, they use capital letters. So it's fine, but unfortunately you cannot hear it when I pronounce it in my talk. So I have to find another way to differentiate between self and ego, the self which is not the ego in its depth. First of all, we heard in um, Marx's uh, talk that Freud very rarely uses the word self. So he does not differentiate between ego and self. And later on in mm -hmm. ego psychology and after all in object relations theory, the self as a representation of the ego, as self-representation and object representation arrive. And still later on in self-psychology of Heinz Kohut, the, the importance of the parents for the developing self becomes crucial. The gleam in the mother's eye, which we need, which is necessary for our development, this enthusiasm of a parent seeing the little child with its behavior, with its soul uh, who comes. And we have also the point of view of Metzinger, anti-realistic, in the ego tunnel, there is no self. There's an illusion of the world and also an illusion of the self. And he says, however, there seems to be no empirical evidence and no truly convincing conceptual argument that supports the actual existence of a self. Not, nothing forces us to make this assumption. And we heard quite a lot of uh, the uh, cool group, cool, queer and, and cool um, wrote about conceptual versus integrated self. So you also have many um, examples for this differentiation between ego and self. And very important for my talk, the differentiation between pre-reflective minimal self and narrative self. So in the theory of predictive coding, it's a theory of probability of based on the Bayesian theorem. The brain solves the seemingly intractable problem of modeling distal, distal causes of sensory input through a version of inference. I'm not able to explain the mathematical foundations, so let me su suggest by examples. And the first example would be motricity. So when we move, uh, there's a difference between our moves and being moved. 
When we move, we make efference copies of our motor commands and we compare them afterwards whether we did a good movement or an, a clumsy, awkward movement, for instance. And so we differentiate between the other's movement and our own movement. So this it's, if you want, a motor self which helps us to differentiate self and the others. So in this paper of um, Neven, you find the predictive mind and this prediction of the self in all our actions. The system, you may say the brain, but we have also the gut brain and our whole body, not, it's not everything in our head. So our organism tests prior hypothesis by comparing predicted sensory states with the actual sensory. And there may be a mismatch between what we want to generate, most of it is clearly uh, unconscious, and what will be the case. And perception may be external, exteroperception uh, and also enteroception, actively compared with predictions. So when we have this mismatch, we speak in, uh, in a clinical context of symptoms. So the classical model is you have an, in, an input and then a perception and you compare it with prior knowledge. And the new model is that the organism has prior knowledge and prediction and sensory activation. So this, this hypothesis the organism makes is important for how we perceive and how we differentiate between ourselves and the world. A little example, it's a person uh, suffering from uh, stomach pain, but it may also be hunger. It's not necessarily a, um, a pathological um, a symptom. So there is always um, a kind of scanning about our interior state and normally this prediction corresponds with what we are perceiving uh, in our brainstem, what uh, Mark explained us. And then maybe now a mismatch, so a kind of pain or uh, disturbances or whatever it, uh, it is. And now there are different possibilities to cope with this mismatch. Here you see the person uh, will take uh, some drugs uh, in order to cope with uh, the pain. So this is um, possibility number one. So it's a kind of action or active inference. I adapt my model to prior knowledge. Or there may be by perceptual inference and adaptation of my model to perception. Perhaps using cognitive strategies. Neben uses this theory of predictive um, processing or predictive uh, coding for developing a pattern theory of the self. And there are two uh, controversies. The first I mentioned already uh, Metzinger's no self theory, uh, but also a metaphysical substance theory, thinking that the self or the soul, uh, in its highest form in the Cartesian uh, substance dualism, is sufficiently defined by what it is. So here we have a process model. I uh, quote Neven in normal conditions we receive permanently changing sensory motor and or affective informations which is also used to construct self-related 
information and the latter constitutes an effective flow. Thus, an effective flow of self-related information is normally the basis of the integration of all contextually relevant self-related information into a working self. Thus, the embodied self is the core of our contextually relevant self-model. Now, before uh, or without knowing uh, the uh, theory of predictive uh, processing, Jung already spoke about the self as the archetypical pattern of the ego. And I quote uh, now one of the uh, major um, points of Jung, sensing the self as something irrational, as an indefinable existent to which the ego is neither opposed nor subjected, but merely attached, and about which it revolves very much as the earth revolves around the sun. Thus we come to the goal of individuation, so the goal of our life. I use the word sensing in order to indicate the apperceptive character of the relation between ego and self. In this relation nothing is knowable because we can say nothing about the contents of the self. The ego is the only content of the self that we do know. The individuate, individuated ego senses itself as the object of an unknown and superordinate subject. It seems to me that our psychological inquiry must come to a stop here, for the idea of a self is itself a transcendental postulate, which also justifiable psychologically does not allow of scientific proof. That's why I said this morning that we cannot operationalize the self. Huh? This step beyond science is an unconditional requirement of the psychological development I've sought to depict, because without this postulate I could give no adequate formulation of the psychic processes that occur, occur empirically. At the very least, therefore, the self can claim the value of an hypothesis analogous to that of the structure of the atom. And even though we should once again be enmeshed in an image, it is nonetheless powerful alive and its interpretation quite exceeds my powers. I have no doubt at all that it is an image but one in which we are contained. So we cannot give the content of this image, but we are contained in this image. And it's beyond science. So it's a pity we cannot operationalize it. And it's also a notion in Jung which is not clearly defined at all. It may be individuality, midpoint between conscious and unconscious, union of opposites, totally of the psyche, center of the psyche, archetype, wholeness, organizing, principle. The self, writes Jung, is not only the center but also the whole circumference of the psyche. And in many of Jung's passages, the self and the psyche are synonymous. It may be also the world, Jung says, as I see in the psyche in a world in which the ego is contained. Maybe there are fishes out there who believe that they contain the sea. We must rid ourselves of this habitual illusion of ours. So Jung, as a panpsychist, thinks that psyche and matter are contained in one and the same world and moreover are in continuous contact with one another. And that it is very likely that psyche and matter are two different aspects of one and the same thing. Looking for an anchor in the philosophical tradition, I have opened Sick Domen Til Doden, Sickness, uh, Sickness Unto Death of um, Kierkegaard and at the very beginning we have those three despairs. Despair, he says, is a sickness of the spirit of the self and accordingly can take three forms. Despair not to be conscious of having a self, not despair in the strict sense, so it's a kind of unconscious, not awareness of a self, 
in despair not to will to be oneself, in despair to will to be oneself. And I will treat this third despair now, reminding and keeping in mind that for Kierkegaard the self is a relationship and for Jung that ego and self are differentiated. As Zarathustra says or Nietzsche says in Zarathustra, behind thy thoughts and feelings, my brother, there's a mighty Lord, an unknown sage, sage. It is called self. It dwelleth in thy body, it is thy body. There is more sagacity in thy body than in thy best wisdom. And who then knoweth why thy body requireth just thy best wisdom? The self laugheth at thine ego and its proud prancings. What are these prancings and flights of thought unto me? It says to itself, a byway to my purpose. I am the leading string of the ego and the prompter of its notions. Now coming back to Kierkegaard, in this paragraph he says that the second formulation, so the second despair to will to be oneself is the expression of the complete dependence of the relation of the self, the expression for the inability of the self to arrive at to be in equilibrium and rest by itself, but only in relating itself to itself by relating itself to that which has established the entire relation. Since birth I have been thrown into the world, as Heidegger says, geworfen sein. Conversely, if I establish myself, I am my own God and creator. And the only despair is not to will to be oneself, but to will to do with oneself. In other words, I am prone to suicide. And here, let us briefly resume Kierkegaard's allusion to the Bible. Uh, it's the... Um, the, the passage in, in John 11 where Jesus hears about Lazarus' illness and exclaims, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God and the Son of God might be glorified thereby. For Kierkegaard, sickness, the whole life is called despair. It is, it is both a terminological disease, struggling for this notion of self, and an existential one. Who is the subject? How can we name it? This spirit, this self in relationship. And I think Jung's differentiation of ego and self may help us understand what is an aware person and what is a strictly despaired or unconsciously despaired person. What is an established person or a not established person. In what follows, I would like to show that this terminological differentiation clarifies also the existential ones. The pronouns I and self can be nominalized. We have discussed to discuss this later on. So it may be reification, the I or the ego and the self. Anyway, this nominalization transforms these two words into synonyms representing identity. Who I am is shown by an identity card, for instance, or here by the, the room cards we have. Give us a hint who we are, what number is our, our room. Even when I have forgotten all my logins, all my passwords, I can recover the, these signs efficiently, my electronic finger points and so on, fingerprints. Freud does not distinguish self and ego, and over the course of time, psychoanalytic um, theories will use the self for expressing self-representation. And now, this notion of self-ego axis coined by Erich Neumann. The, mo the mother represents the world to the infant. She is 
the first representation of the self and of the world. Jung writes, how one ever may define the self, it is always something other than the ego. And inasmuch as a higher insight of the ego leads over to the self, the self is a more comprehensive thing, which includes the experience of the ego and therefore transcend it. Just as the ego is a certain experience I have of myself, so is the self an experience of my ego. It is, however, no longer experienced in the form of a broader or higher ego, but in the form of a non-ego. So this negation of all we know about the ego is very central for Jung and, as we see now, also for Neumann. Neumann, who coins this term ego-self axis writes, the ego-self axis comes into being when the ego is established as a derivative of the self, when it moves away from the self. This moving away attains its culmination in the first half of life, when the, the psyche separates into conscious and unconscious systems, and the ego achieves an apparent autonomy. In the individuation process characteristic of the second half of the life, the ego and the self move back together again. So, schematically, life begins with a kind of fusion of self and ego, and then, in basically in the mother-child relationship, there will be this axis, this relationship between the, let's say, hatching ego, coming out of the self and the self. And in the second half of the life, ego and self will be differentiated. And there's also the idea that in a certain manner, when our ego disappears, when we die, the self will remain. This is um, uh, an interesting point that the self is stronger than the ego. Neumann says that the primal relationship of the child to the mother is the essential foundation for every I-Thou relationship. The relationship of the ego to the self, which is the ego-self axis of the psyche, is also based upon it. This establishes the central importance of the child's relationship of trust and love towards its mother for the ego's subsequent attitude of trust toward the self. In fact, it provides the psychological basis for all faith and all security in the world. Those words could be also repeated by attachment theory, that our primary caregivers give us this experience of security, which we have as an inner working model if this security is experienced during our whole life or we, we are searching for it when we did not experience it. We look for it for having in other relationships uh, this security. And in Jungian uh, thinking, this primary relationship is the first instantiation of the ego-self relationship. Let us once more ask, should we nominalize ego and self? Ego in English is a Latin pronoun nominalized. Thus, it, it is clear that this manner of speaking is an, is an abstraction of the English pronouns I and me differentiated by James, for instance. Despite this Latin loan word nominalizing the pronoun ego, there risks to be an artificial transformation of ordinary language. And this is still more obvious in the notion of self. So Stolarov and Edward um, write the following the language of self psychology, with its noun, the self, reifies the experiencing of selfhood and transforms it into an entity 
with things like properties. A self is an entity that we can have or not have. It has two poles joined by a tension arc. I can be cohesive or fragmented. I can be enfeebled, but in psychoanalysis it can be rehabilitated. Sometimes it even has the characteristics of a human agent, as when it seeks self-objects, more entities, or when fragmented, it somehow performs action to restore its cohesion. End of the, this quotation of Stolarov and Edward. Substantializing objectifications, reifications of actions and sentences formulated in the first person perspective may jeopardize a dynamic expression of psychological processes similar to Freud's structural model. Especially identity and identification may be misunderstood as closed processes. So as a self-attained or a soul found or a psyche defined or measured or operationalized. Rigid formulas of identity I, are, according to Jung, illusions linked to the ego complex. For Jung, the ego is a complex among others. So as we may have a negative mother complex or uh, I don't know, a helper complex or, um, or an Oedipus complex, whatever. Um, all those complexes have an um, archetypical core. We may also suffer from our ego complex, hmm? especially when there is an heroic inflation of this ego complex, when this ego uh, becomes too important in our, in our psyche. So this inflation of the conscious ego, which imagines a mastery of the world, in spite of being in relationship with this world. So uh, I think it, uh, it was a very um, intelligent idea of Jung to classify the ego as one of the complexes because it may be um, a cause of trouble, of uh, neurosis, and also a resource of, of development, as uh, the other uh, complexes are. A self for Jung is both the psyche's unconscious core and the whole psyche. We can say it transcends the ego. It is, in Kierkegaard's terms, not established by ourselves, by the ego. Itself, it is established by the other. Kierkegaard, as a thinker in the Christian tradition, thinks uh, the, uh, those relationships in terms of creation, of um, a divine other who is the founder of our identity. Nevertheless, we can uh, secularize uh, Kierkegaard's uh, thoughts and thinking that we are not establishing ourselves, but we are receiving uh, this self which is not once more established by ourselves. It is relational this self. The depth of the self, I would like to say, is the known ego. The depth of the self is the known ego. It is not the self-affirmation of an owned selfhood, but a long journey towards an asymptote, which we cannot reach, we never will can say, now I have realized my individuation. Now I have uh, attained myself. It's always 
like a goal uh, in our lives. Let me come to a conclusion and returning to uh, Kierkegaard. The depth of the self, as I said, may be understood as a despair. So as a crisis, we can say. So that it's an, not only a terminological crisis that he is pondering uh, the self, uh, the other, uh, the spirit established by itself, established by the other, and so on. But basically, it's an existential crisis, this despair. Terminological, a first conclusion and invitation also for your questions and, and uh, remarks and ideas. Terminologically, the self is not at all restic restricted to an identity, to a solipsistic identity. It is relation, it is development, lifelong development. Becoming what I am and what I am not yet. Individuation, as Jung understands it, transcends the ego's narrow boundaries, opening itself towards the self. Consequently, the terminology suggested here in, in this talk becomes paradoxical. The self established by the other is a gift, an outcome that I do not possess. So I receive a gift, but I'm not, uh, it's not my property. I cannot, um, I cannot cling to it. It's a gift I will share. This terminological paradox expresses an existential paradox, reminding all us that all ego finding is ego losing. In the Christian tradition, as I said um, in beginning this talk, the logion for whoever wishes to save his psyche will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, indicates that there's an unconscious aspect of self-deep, of our decentering of our conscious ego.